welcome everyone. So Jean, are you willing to start? Sure, yes, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Before I do that, I just wanted to um, recognize the fact that there is so much suffering in the world right now. So much. We're all holding it. And as many people wiser than I say, we can't hold it alone. And so it's so uh, lovely to have all of you here tonight uh, to help us meet what life is presenting, which seems to be just more and more every day. And so I would invite you, if there's any one or any ones that you would like to invite into this circle, this group tonight, just to reflect for a moment on, can be animal beings, human beings, uh, the earth, uh, groups of people, or maybe individuals that you personally know. So just to reflect a moment on whether or not there's someone that you would like to call in. Although they're not physically present, we can can include them in this practice of self-compassion. And as Jane said, we're cultivating self-compassion not only for ourselves, but for others. So let's start with just a, a settling in meditation. So let's start by just taking a few deep breaths, breathing in slowly and breathing out. Settling the nervous system with a few deep breaths. And as you do so, beginning to make contact with the body. Feeling perhaps the weight of the body sitting. Or the contact with whatever you're sitting on. How do you know you have a body? What do you feel? The body's not an idea in our heads. The body is, is felt. So what do you feel in the body? And feeling the uprightness of your posture. Not rigid or stiff, but just a sense of the upright axis of the body. From the head to the bottom of the spine. The felt sense of uprightness in the body supported by the uprightness, the goodness of your intention this evening. So we all committed to spending some time together. That is a good intention. So connecting to the goodness of that intention And perhaps also the intention to be present, to be kind, to meet whatever arises moment to moment with compassion. To sit in stillness and to meet whatever shows up with love.
feeling the uprightness of the body and the goodness of your intention. And feeling once again the breath in the body. Feeling it extend throughout the body as though the whole body were breathing. Inviting it to enter into those places that feel tight or constricted. The places that need release. Inviting the body to relax with each breath, breathing in and breathing out. Sitting upright, breathing. Imagining perhaps that you are standing at the doorway of your experience, not needing to draw back or go forward, just standing and receiving. Allowing the breath and the felt sense of the body, the uprightness of the body, the uprightness of your intention to provide support as you stand at the threshold of your moment to moment experience. Being curious about whatever shows up, not needing to change anything, fix anything, make it go away. Just sitting upright, body breathing, noticing what is arising in heart and mind. This is how it is now. Can I meet it with compassion? Letting go of any wish to make something happen. Not naming yourself this or that, just opening to the love and the kindness that naturally resides in your heart. Feeling the strength of non-defense, of non-aggression, of non-doing.
breathing in and breathing out. Thank you, Jean. It, it was lovely. I, I realized many of the things I wanted to talk about this evening you touched on experientially in that uh, meditation. So what I'd like to do is just offer a few thoughts and um, just invite you to sort of, as I talk, sort of see if you can just um, notice if anything of this sort of resonates with you. And um, I'll stop at moments for an opportunity to reflect or an opportunity to um, sort of say if there's pieces that arise for you. So tonight what I wanted to talk about um, was to explore what I consider the inherent sense of irony or paradox, which is at the core of Buddhist teachings and thus also at the core of self-compassion practice because self-compassion practice comes from the Buddhist teachings. And I'd like to begin just by speaking a little bit about what I see as irony and paradox and how it shows up in the teachings of the Buddha and the practice of self-compassion. And then I'd like us to just explore a little bit what might be the effect in our own lives Maybe perhaps how we could perhaps embrace the paradox that we experience, how we might be able to sort of let go a little bit of deeply held beliefs and expectations as a way to sort of push against um, these held beliefs, these ironies within our own lives so that we might be able to benefit a bit more from the practice. So I'd like to just start by defining what I mean by irony or paradox. So it's a little helpful, maybe. And of course, I googled, and these are some of the things I came up with. It says that irony, irony is the contrast between how, how things seem and how they actually are. Irony is the contrast between what we expect and what actually happens. Irony occurs, I love this one, when the truth contradicts the expected outcome. When the truth contradicts the expected outcome. And often in common usage, the word paradox is often used to refer to a statement or a situation which is ironic. So a paradox is, is that situation or statement which runs contrary to our expectation. So it's kind of interesting. The word paradox comes from ancient Greek and, and it is two pieces. The first one is para, which means beyond or outside of. And the second piece is the verb dokian, to think. So they form the word para, Doxos, which means contrary to expectation. So I think this is interesting. I think the practice of mindfulness, the Buddha's teaching, and also self-compassion, as we're going to talk about, asks us to go beyond or outside of our usual thinking or expectations so that we're able to experience something new. Does that make sense, folks? I, I'm, I'm sure people's minds are kind of starting to hopefully sort of uh, wake up to this. I'd like to start with a quote from Pema Chodron from her book, Start Where You Are. And in her wonderful Pema way, she says, one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddhist tradition is that as long as you're wishing for things to change, they never will. As long as you're wanting yourself to get better, you won't. And as long as you have an orientation towards the future, 
You can never just relax into what you already have and already are. So I think this sense of paradox in the Buddhist teaching comes through. And there's also a sense of paradox and self-compassion from a lot of the quotes from Kristen Neff, which is one of the creators of, of the curriculum that we use. And about self-compassion, here's a couple she says, and you probably, those of you who have practiced with this for a while, have heard Jean and I say this. We don't practice self-compassion to make it better. We practice self-compassion because it hurts. Another quote, the key to happiness is understanding that suffering is caused by resisting pain. Let's say that again, the key to happiness is understanding that suffering is caused by resisting pain. And the third quote from Kristen Neff, Neff the beauty of self-compassion is that instead of replacing negative feelings with positive ones, we actually create new positive emotions that are generated by our ability to embrace the negative ones. So I think these statements express some of the very important ironies or paradoxes in these practices. And I think they highlight the really significant shift um, that is asked for us to be able to make our typical relationship to our suffering shift in a significant way so that we can open up to the possibility of compassion, self-compassion. So oftentimes I think about when we're struggling with something difficult, we, we often can have like one of two responses. We can want to just turn away from it. We can just ignore it, get away, run away. Just it's our basic fight or flight sort of just getting away from pain or threat. And I think about all the ways I do that. You know, I drink alcohol, I eat food, I watch TV. I blame someone else, I, all kinds of different ways that I have of going, oh, I don't want to. So I just you know, want to invite you just for a moment, if you want to, if you'd like to, you're brave enough, just maybe close your eyes, take a deep breath and just see if you can sort of resonate with this piece, this typical reaction we can have to difficulty or pain of wanting to turn away, maybe numb out or ignore. So oftentimes if we don't just, you're right, we go into fix it mode. I either have to fix myself, I have to fix the other person, or I have to fix the situation. And, um, Actually, this sort of can be the basis of that inner critic, can't it? That part of us that says, why can't you do that? Or once you do that, you know, I say, well, oh, once I lose those 10 pounds, I'm going to get a new pair of jeans. <laughs> or, you know, or, or once I learn how to do this, then I'll. So I really believe that one of these two things are often what we do, believing that it's going to make things better. And um, it doesn't, it doesn't, we keep trying. And every, maybe every once in a while it does, we get intermittent reinforcement, so we keep trying. But oftentimes it leaves inside of us a pain or a difficulty with ourselves or a self-criticism or a feeling of disconnection from the world. But these are very human responses to suffering. We want to fix it. We want to get away from it. We want to make it different. But what's interesting is the irony, the paradox in the practice of self-compassion is that it asks us rather than to turn away or to make different, to turn towards and to, um, to accept, to acknowledge, to abide by what's happening. 
And this can be a very powerful thing. And it's really interesting because it goes against all of these pieces that we are deeply ingrained to do both um, systematically within our and ourselves and culturally and relationally. It's interesting that I think, um, again, Pema Chodron does a wonderful job of highlighting that this way of working with difficulty actually has embedded in it a very distinct sort of self-aggression. You know, a self-aggression that says, if I'm just different, this would be better. Or if I could just, then this would, or if I didn't do this, it would be better. And this can really um, add to the pain, add to the suffering. So I would just again, just invite you to pause for a moment, close your eyes if you like, and just notice maybe what's alive in your body right now as we talk about this. Just notice if there might be some ways that are familiar to you that you either like to move away from, ignore, or you want to fix. Last week, we had an experience. We were working with a contractor who actually um, wasn't listening to me and also was incompetent. <laughs> And I realized I became rather harsh and also controlling. I was like, wow. And I really tried to stop, you know, and, and sort of use these skills. And I realized when I feel like I'm not being heard or I'm not being taken care of or something bad could happen, I start to feel really vulnerable. And then what happens out of this is this very harsh sort of controlling part comes and says, I'll take care of you. <laughs> I'll make sure this doesn't happen. So it was really a, a wonderful reflection and it had to come out of that sort of self-compassionate place where I could say, oh, sweetie, you are really struggling right now. This is difficult for you to have this person who you want to trust and you think gets what you need is not on the same page. And I realized that's sort of a minor little, you know, when I look at the whole suffering in the world, but oftentimes those are the places where we can start to see these patterns that we, that we have, these patterns we have to try to stay safe, to try to protect ourselves. Two of the ways that we'll be practicing tonight to be with it is feeling it in the body, and also, uh, well, 3D, you know, reaching out and imagining or even actually connecting with others or naming. Naming can be really helpful for us. So thank you. It's really. So I just like to say, so the irony or the paradox here uh, in, in contrast to this natural way we have of criticizing or fixing or want to make different or run away is that the practice of self-compassion at its root asks us to turn towards and to be with and to soften, not to, not to tighten and, and push against and guard, but to soften. And it also asks us to accept. And I think accept again can be a very confusing word. Accept does not mean that we tolerate bad behavior, we tolerate something that is really um, not okay. It doesn't mean that we have to say, I feel fine. Um, what it really means, I think the tolerance, um, tolerance might be a better word for it, is it's a willingness to be emotionally present to whatever is happening within us at the moment. It's our willingness to be with a painful part of ourselves or the world 
in a kind relationship. And for me, this is where the self-compassion comes in really importantly, because it offers us actual modes of being able to turn towards and tolerate. Because if we turn towards and tolerate with that old mindset of criticism, judgment, um, isolation, it just makes it worse. So we have to turn towards with a whole different sort of, um, way of being. And that's what I find that the self-compassion practices allow us. And so maybe we can just take a couple of moments to talk about what some of those are, and then we can do some movement. We can come back and we can just practice them for a bit and just see everyone is different and everybody is different at different times in your practice. At some point, one might work better for you than another. So I love that about the, the practice of self-compassion. It's sort of like a toolkit. <laughs> There's different things that we can do to just allow ourselves to be with or both. <laughs> and um, there's wisdom. You, you said, I was just ruminating in judgment. When we're in that place of ruminating in judgment, turning towards doesn't help. So we go and we see where can I get support to shift into a kinder place, Do you know? But then you go, oh, maybe I'm avoiding. <laughs> and, oh, I feel good about doing this, but I'm better than my ex-husband. <laughs> so I, I don't know other people, but I really appreciate what you said because there's a constant process of wisdom. Of, of understanding sort of the nuances of what we're doing. And I really appreciate your honesty. We have to, we're part of it is the courage to be honest and say, is this, uh, is this avoiding or is this getting support to shift the way I can be present? Um, a very uh, important uh, piece of the self-compassion practice is this idea, if, if it's, if, help me, Jean, if I'm not, is that opening of spaciousness, um, of seeing it in a larger context. And I also love how deeply you, you talked about another thing in self-compassion is the common humanity, how we resonate with someone else and that we see that we each one of us struggles so, um, and also Robert, you said that too, you could see pieces. It's like, oh, I too am human. I too experience that. So that's part of the practice. You can, when you turn towards, you can give it more spaciousness and you can also appreciate sort of that common humanity, how we're connected, how you can imagine somebody else might feel the same way how you can see what you experience or what you feel. You can see it out in the world in the same way. So that's a really lovely part of the practice. And when we feel it in the body, that helps us get away of, from the labeling. Like we might say, um, or like maybe I feel really lonely right now. And lonely feels like an ache in my body here, or I feel it this way. And it brings us into the present moment rather than I'm really lonely right now. And our message to ourselves might be, that's because nobody likes me <laughs> or that's because I never belong or, you know, and those are just rabbit holes we go down. So if we come to the body and then if we can just say, oh, this is the ache of loneliness. Can I just be kind? Just like I would be kind to a friend if a friend told me this. That is a really good practice in self-compassion. Imagine what you do for a friend and you can do it for yourself. And then and you can see me putting my hand on my chest. This is a, you know, you can also physical soothing is very important. You know, just putting your hand on your chest and sometimes just on your cheek or just wrapping yourself in a warm blanket. There's just physical sort of um, soothing. And so we learn also kind words. This is where loving kindness practice or self-compassion practice, it's, oh, sweetheart, or may I not be afraid, or may I trust um, in my own spirit, or may I be free of this difficulty. So we can offer ourselves 
uh, phrases, uh, support. So these are just some of the different ways that self-compassion is turning towards with a kindness and a spaciousness we can play with. And if it's new, as I said, it can feel really weird because it's a paradox, it's an irony. We don't think we're gonna get the outcome that we're supposed to get. We are supposed to do the old behaviors <laughs> to get the outcome. So, so Jean, would you be willing to lead us in just a bit of movement? We can move around however you'd like to stand up, move around however Jean guides us and then we'll do a little bit of practice. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say one thing, share one thing that I uh, experienced yesterday. So the University as a, of Minnesota has a large NIH grant to teach veterans around the country who suffer from chronic pain to teach them mindfulness. And so I got to sit in on one of the sessions last night. And it, would talk, and it reminded me of what Jane was, or Jane reminded me of that because it was such a paradox. These were people that have been living with chronic, in some cases, intense pain for years. And they're now being, um, it's now being suggested that they turn towards the pain rather than all of the things that they've been doing to try to cope. And it's, it was very moving and very poignant and uh, humbling, really, to, um, to see that even those who have suffered grievous physical harm could were, were learning how to have a different relationship with those physical sensations. And you know, some of them get it and some of them don't. I mean, this is their first introduction to it. But some of them were beginning to realize that all of the tension that they were holding in their bodies, the, the resistance to their pain, was exacerbating it. So it was uh, just what Jane was sharing reminded me of that. So I wanted to share it. So um, one of the one of the ways that many of us uh, uh, exhibit a lack of self compassion is how we relate to our bodies, and uh, you know we want them to be different than they are, fix them in some way. I'll speak for myself. That that's been my life story, uh, uh, and so. Uh, learning to move our bodies and uh, offer ourselves compassion through touch and all of those things is a wonderful antidote for those harsh messages and perhaps practices that we've been engaging in for most of our lives. There's a wonderful book called Death, The, the End to Self-Improvement. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we don't have to die in order to self stop the self-improvement game that we're in. So um, so I'm just going to uh, uh, suggest that you stand up if that feels okay to you. Um, if not, um, remain seated. And um, just to take a moment and just feel what it feels like to uh, move from a seated posture to a standing one. Um, sometimes this can just in itself can be an act of self-compassion just to, especially if we've been sitting in front of Zoom for hours, to just change our posture. So take a moment and just feel what it feels like to be connected to the earth through the feet. And if you want, you can just rock back and forth, maybe side to side. Noticing where you feel a little off balance and where you feel more in balance. You could rock forward and back. So just playing with the sense of proprioception, where the body is in space. And then coming back to a place where it feels more stable and still. Perhaps appreciating once again that we can stand if we can, and appreciating the fact that the earth is holding us up and that we can experience that support through the feet. 
that's one very important tool that we can use when we find ourselves ruminating about what's not right. We can just come to this basic sense of stillness and rootedness of support. And if you'd like, you could begin to move a little bit, maybe just walking in place, moving your feet at whatever pace feels right to you. Noticing what that does to the mind. Sometimes it speeds up the mind to actually bring movement, just noticing and being curious. And then coming back again to that still point. And then with soft knees, taking a, a moment to just begin to move the arms around the torso, getting a little twist from the left to the right or whatever feels right. And then slowly coming back to stillness. And then if you like, you can just come up on the toes a little bit and down. So this, as we get older, the bones thin out a bit and it's good to just bounce a little bit. That brings some resiliency to the body and helps to strengthen the bones. So just bouncing a little bit. And then if you'd like to make the bounce a little bigger and shake your arms or whatever feels comfortable, nobody's looking, just letting the body do what it needs to do. You could really let it loose if you want to. <laughs> so shaking and moving and just following your input own impulse for what your body needs right now after having sat for almost an hour. So moving in whatever way feels good, maybe stretching your arms over your head or whatever you'd like. Breathing as you do so. And then slowly at your own pace, coming back to that still point, standing on both feet feeling the support of the earth, noticing what's present in the body now after some very simple movement. And then when you're ready, coming back to a seated posture. Thank you, Jean. Well, it seems much kinder to do a city practice after we've done a little bit of movement and taking care of our body. Thank you. So we'll just um, do a little bit of a, a sitting practice here for maybe about 15 minutes. Uh, I'll guide you through some of the um, some of the practices of self-compassion that you might find helpful to, to help you turn towards as we've been talking about. And I just uh, invite you to be curious, sort of play with it, see what, what you like, what you don't like, what might work, what might not work. Um, and then knowing that you can always come back to any one of these. Uh, and you can do this in a sitting practice, you can do it in the moment, all kinds of possibilities. So perhaps by beginning, by perhaps closing your eyes or lowering your gaze, if that's comfortable. And just maybe just taking a few deep, full breaths to settle the body. Inviting yourself through the deep breaths into just being here.
letting go of the words and the conversation. And then just letting your breath come to a natural rhythm. And I'd like to invite you to just bring up something in your life that feels difficult. I just wanna invite you not to take on the most painful, difficult, terrible one, but just something that you're aware of. And if you really can't think of anything, you might, you could just pinch your finger and feel the pain if that feels like a safer way to access these practices today. So just choose something, might be an old pattern you've been aware of or a difficult relationship, a health thing, or just something that you're feeling right now. It doesn't have to be the perfect choice, just pick one. And let yourself sort of settle in to sort of how this particular difficulty or discomfort in your life, just beginning by noticing how you experience it in your body. It's really inviting your attention to come into the body perhaps doing a gentle scan of the body. Where and how do I feel this difficulty physically? Maybe it's a numbness or an ache, a tingling. And just see if you can turn towards whatever you notice in your body with a sense of kindness. Leaning towards in the same way you would lean towards a beloved pet or a child or a dear friend. Just noticing what's present in the body. And just noticing if there's any judgment that comes up and if there is letting it go and coming back to whatever kindness you can find. Sometimes this coming back to the physical sense helps us from going back into the past and into the future and going into our stories. It invites us to just be present to the raw sensation of being human. Can I just be with this sensation and allow it? being curious about it. And perhaps you might even Consider something that feels physically soothing. You might put a hand or hands on your heart, on your chest, and just feel the warmth of your hands. Perhaps feel your heart beating or your chest rising and falling with your breath.
or there might be some other touch that could feel soothing at this time. Sometimes we just give ourselves a gentle hug. Again, just feeling the warmth and the pressure of our hands on our skin. And we might even just imagine that a kindness or a care can pass through our hands into our body using the power of imagination. Or we might imagine that the touch is the touch of someone who cares and loves us, who would want to be present to us. Just letting yourself be curious, playful, experiment. How can I be with the physical sensation of this difficulty with a sense of kindness? And if you're a visual person, you might even be able to imagine being held in a loving embrace or in a white light. Or you might be able to envision yourself in the presence of a loved being or a spiritual support person. Just allow yourself to play with how image might help you hold this difficulty in a more spacious way. Or if you're more of a verbal person, you might imagine what are words that could be helpful. You might imagine what a good friend would say. Or you might imagine what is your heart's yearning and offer that to yourself. be as simple as this too will pass. Or I'm here with you, you're not alone. Or perhaps what you're feeling makes sense. Many people feel the same thing. Sometimes the loving kindness phrases are helpful. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be free from harm.
or maybe there's a phrase that you would create that speaks to whatever you are experiencing right now. May I hold myself with kindness through this difficulty. May I offer myself the compassion that I deserve. May I trust my own goodness even when I make mistakes. Just playing with whatever might be of support. Offering yourself the kindness and spaciousness to be able to turn towards and hold with kindness the difficulty that you experience. Just allowing yourself to notice what sort of practice helps you, supports you. Could be imagining, could be words, it could be touch. Could be tuning into the body. And you're not trying to make it go away. You're not trying to make the pain not be there. You're only allowing yourself to be present, to honor, to respect, to acknowledge the messiness of being human, the difficulty of being born on this planet as a human with all of its difficulties. We're not making it better. We're just being with it, with the kindness and respect and courage that we each have. So just in the last few moments of this meditation, I invite you just to take note of how this experience was for you. And also to just be kind to it was difficult. Maybe your mind was busy and nothing really seemed to fit. And to also be in kind relationship to that. 
as we began our talk, we realized that this way of being in relationship to difficulty is totally different than the way that we are wired and the way society and culture tells us to respond. So just in being curious and trying it, you're being wonderfully bold and courageous. And just take that in and have appreciation for that. And to know that at any time, in any place, you can return to explore this paradox of being in relationship with difficulty, whatever you experience in a kind and loving and compassionate way. As you hear the sound of the bell, you can slowly and gently move your body, opening your eyes and turning on your cameras if they've been turned off. I just have to say, when I started doing these kinds of practices, they were so weird to me. <laughs> I was deeply invested in that other way of being in the world. I love what you said, Joe, about you know starting where you can start. So starting with the child, you know, if you can't do it with your friends, then go to where you can do it, or an animal, or whatever allows you to touch into that space. Oh, thanks for sharing that. I think it's really wonderful. Each there's a shared experience that I really love what you're saying, Rhonda. And there's also each one of us has our own journey uh, into this practice and what really resonates with us. So it's really uh, lovely to hear those different sharings from folks. So, I'm wondering, Jean, would would you like to do the sharing of the merit? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, I wanted to make one other comment. Um, Jane, where is Jane? She's off my screen. Huh, did we lose Jane? Uh, anyways, Jane mentioned um, earlier that she um, uh, that she had trouble calling herself sweetie. Um, so one of my practices has been to call other people sweetie. And if you do that enough, then eventually it seems to come around to you. So I'll just offer that as another compassion practice, the sweetie practice. My older sister, who's now deceased, called everybody sweetie. And first I thought it was really weird, but I've come to really appreciate it. So, so try the sweetie practices if that's something that you struggle with. So along those lines, I mentioned at the beginning that um, one of the practices we often do at the end of practice sessions is um, offering the merit or dedicating the merit or the goodness of our having shown up tonight and practicing together, uh, dedicating that to the welfare of all beings. So I would invite you to uh, participate in that with me. Here's Jane again. Um, so if you'd like to find a comfortable posture, whatever that might be for you, and just taking a moment to reflect on, 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 again, the goodness of your having shown up tonight. There are many things you could do on a Friday night. 
but instead you made the choice to join this group, this sangha tonight, in the practice of self-compassion. So allowing yourself to connect to that, this is not nothing, it is significant. And dedicating whatever merit, whatever goodness may have come from this, dedicating that to the welfare of all beings. Two-legged beings like us, four-legged beings, eight-legged beings, beings with no legs, beings with many legs, being seen and unseen, beings that fly and beings that swim. May all beings everywhere know the sweetness of self-compassion. May all beings everywhere know peace. Thank you, Jane, for leading this group and for coming back. I see you got dropped for a minute. Thank you all for being here. We couldn't do this by ourselves. And uh, may you all be kind. <laughs>